uh, thank you. Yes, indeed, we are uh, reaching the third uh, chapter of that story, which is focusing on uh, the present and more than the present, the possible future of futures, the best and the worst. Uh, in that, uh, uh, I mean by present starting uh, roughly 2000. Uh, that is when the system, that system uh, of uh, so-called neoliberal, and which I uh, analyze as generalized, globalized, financialized, monopoly capital, uh, has started imploding. And if the word imploding is too strong because implosions is usually very brutal, is falling apart, at least, uh, and it will continue to fall apart, in my view. Now, um, that started, uh, this is the start, and not by pure chance, of uh, a second wave of the, let's call it the rise of the South, uh, that is the rise of the peripheries. Uh, now, this rise of the peripheries appear um, as something uh, not uh, in conflict with the apparent logic of capitalism, uh, because we, what we have is a zero growth in the historical uh, centers uh, of imperialism, the triad, US, Europe, and Japan, and 8% uh, uh, growth in China, 5% growth in uh, emerging countries, and even uh, 3 or 4% growth in the uh, uh, countries which are not emerging at all. Um, and on the average, on the average, uh, a high rate of growth in the peripheries. So it looks as if it were catching up. And therefore, many people jump into Samir Amin's theory about center and peripheries uh, belong to the past. We are in a phase of uh, catching up. Um, and uh, and uh, <coughs> now, the uh, uh, historical uh, trend uh, since the uh, Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution, that is the end of the 18th century to this day, is a trend of a growing gap between centers and peripheries, including the most successful peri peripheries. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> but this uh, growing gap is not linear, and there are phases where it is growing fast and phases where it seems to be stagnating or even reduced, and this are uh, the period, the time where precisely it is, uh, uh, it, it is repeated that uh, the process of catching up is, uh, is, um, uh, uh, is, de is, be is deploying and that uh, uh, we, we are going to have uh, a new phase of brilliant uh, capitalism reducing the inequalities at global level. That has been repeated many times, and it happened, has happened already to be incorrect. Now, associated to that is another vision of that future, which is uh, flattering uh, the countries of the South, particularly China. That is that they will have another phase of capitalism, but the center of gravity is moving from uh, declining Europe, at least, and possibly declining even North America, but surely declining Europe, to brilliant success of uh, East and South Asia in particular, and perhaps Latin America, uh, and particularly of, of China. Um, this is very flattering, and uh, uh, a number of uh, Chinese uh, intellectuals who have been, uh, uh, who have been uh, 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 brainwashed in the US uh, believe that nonsense. Huh? Uh, and they are probably believing it strongly. Now, uh, what I'm going to try to show that the process is much more conflictual and, and complex, and that uh, it is not a process of catching up, but a process of questioning the very logic of the capitalist system itself. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, that, that is the, uh, now the, the falling apart or the implosion has many facets, and uh, I cannot look at, even present a very short or brief presentation of all the, of many of the fa major facets of that falling apart, because we could look at it from uh, 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 
falling apart within the societies of the historical centers, North America, Europe, and Japan. We could look at it, uh, this falling apart, from the point of view of the global economy, but also from the point of view of political practices, including questioning the historical democracy, from the point of view of uh, new potentially emerging uh, 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 culture. I don't know exactly what it means. Uh, or we could look at it from some specific but important facets, such as uh, uh, the uh, destruction of the natural basis of reproduction of uh, perhaps even life on the earth, the ecological major problems, etc., etc. I shall <coughs> restrict to one dimension, that is the conflict between precisely the centers and the peripheries, opposite to what is being said. The growing conflict, a growing conflict, and not uh, adjustment within the system. Now, during the short period of the Belle Epoque, that is, in that case, the 90s of last century, for something like 10 years, um, the, uh, the uh, success of high growth in the peripheries in, within the globalization and with, of course, the tools uh, of capitalism, including social relations within the society, seemed to be and was successful in terms of uh, quantitative results. Uh, it was precisely the uh, cleverness of the Chinese leader after Deng Xiaoping, yeah, after the 80s, starting from the early 90s, that um, China could make uh, a good use of globalization by participating to it and having an accelerated export-oriented uh, <coughs> export-oriented industrialization, accelerated industrialization and export-oriented, with rates of growth of exports which were roughly uh, one and a half or twice the rates of growth of GDP, uh, which meant moving from a country with a very little uh, participating uh, ratio in the global uh, trade to a country which is a major trade partner today. And simultaneously, inviting foreign capital to associate to that process of acceleration uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, inviting uh, transnationals to invest in, in China. And that gave uh, results which, uh, I'll come to, to that point later again, which uh, seemed to be uh, very successful. And it was, of course, said that is the end of uh, socialism in China, I will come to this, that point later. Uh, it is the triumph forever of capitalism. It is the end of center periphery. It is a new wave of capitalism and legitimated by very gener big generalities such as capitalism has proved throughout the history that it is a system able to adjust to many things and many changes and so on and so forth, eh? which are generalities half true but uh, adjusting to which extent and at what cost and, uh, and how, eh? and not just adjusting and so on. Uh, so now uh, we have to see, I, I shall look therefore with respect to that uh, growing conflict, uh, A, uh, to the emerging country, uh, China, B, to the so-called emerging country, let's call them semi-emerging or partially emerging, a number of others, and three and C, the non-emerging uh, or even submerging or, uh, or, or, or how do you say in English, uh, uh, sinking. <coughs> sinking, think, sinking countries, uh, and D, uh, it, it does, that does uh, uh, create a problem or more than problem, makes impossible conceiving the uh, north-south, if we call it so, conflict as one, but uh, look into it uh, in a more careful way by uh, um, f uh, taking into account the fragmentation of the south, which is not something very new. Huh? 
Um, now, but now we take those in, in that order. One, China. Now, uh, in China, uh, the debate on China is usually restricted to is it socialist or is it capitalist? And uh, the obvious conclusion uh, is it is capitalist. Uh, and the, obvi the obvious, why, in spite of the fact that the official discourse of the Chinese leadership, it is a phase of building socialism. And the two answers are very quick, superficial, misleading. Uh, because indeed, if we look at the relations of production between uh, the uh, worker, the person who offers his labor, and those who organize the labor, whether they are private owners, capitalists, or uh, a public company, the state, or even a cooperative in which the worker is simultaneously, theoretically, the uh, owner, uh, these relations are very similar to what they have been as uh, being con constructed by capitalism. In that respect, I would say it's obvious that the Soviet Union has never been socialist. It has always been capitalist. And, but that doesn't mean that it was capitalist, the fact that it was not socialist. Because the transition is something much more complicated than that. And this is why uh, a, a very simple qualification of that kind is uh, a little useless. Huh? It's good for uh, superficial polemics, but no, nothing more. Now, well, uh, what we see is that uh, in spite, even during the 90s, even during the 90s, when uh, the pattern of uh, 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 Chinese moving into globalization uh, successfully uh, uh, seemed to be uh, accepting or submitting to the new pattern of future center periphery, as I said, and I won't repeat, based on the uh, control by the centers of major uh, tools of control, technologies, accept, access to natural resources, etc., etc., a financial system, and, uh, uh, and take, uh, taking benefit of, of that in spite of, of those tools, and the process of uh, uh, um, industrialization being a process of de facto subcontracting to the extent that one could say, where is the uh, working class of the United States? It is in China, uh, was said, huh? uh, which is half true and half incorrect. Huh? Um, uh, and we have to see, uh, therefore, what it is exactly, what is this relation. Uh, but even in the 90s with that, uh, two features remain uh, different for, for China than they are for any other country. I will put some nuance later. Um, that is one, land, I mean uh, uh, agricultural land, remained a public commons. That is the formal property of the state uh, managed by the communities, the villages, the association of villages, and not a private property of agricultural land, and it remains such until today. Uh, only Vietnam, there are no other exceptions, has the same fundamental rules. I'll come to that point because it is essential in, uh, in, in, in assessing the nature of uh, uh, China and of state capitalism and the variety of Poss different possibilities of its uh, evolving. The second uh, uh, characteristic which makes uh, the, um, China different from the others is that uh, China did not move into the globalized uh, uh, financial uh, monetary market. That is uh, the Yuan question. Uh, that they have kept the whole, until now, the whole financial system, banking and so on, completely controlled by the state, not only by Chinese, but by the state, and uh, managing their um, yuan uh, out of the flexibility, or so-called flexibility. Uh, it's the, uh, a very big dif difference also. I'll come to that later also. Now, that has uh, been maintained in, in, the, in the 90s, 
and has been in some way reinforced uh, during the past decade, uh, the early 20s, uh, 21st century, uh, and, and, and until now, uh, or at least maintained. Now, that is a sovereign project. That is, China has a sovereign project. And at that point in time, and I'm not qualifying it whether this sovereign project is capitalist or socialist. It is non-capitalist, it is non-socialist. <laughs> uh, it can move towards capitalism, it can move towards socialism, or a further stage on the long road to socialism, but it cannot be reduced to, in spite of what I said about, and in spite of a number of very ugly and common features of capitalism with respect to the exploitation and conditions of labor. This is important, re really important, but it is not uh, enough to uh, qualify a system. Now, this uh, uh, sovereign project, it's important to know what it is because in contrast, we'll see what is not the projects, whenever there are projects, in other countries called or so-called emerging or not emerging hmm? uh, or sinking. Uh, the um, sovereign project is a project one, one, of building a fully integrated, and we should add modernized, if, even if the world is not, uh, have not big sympathy to it, industrial modern sy system. That is not industries. An industrial system is something very different from industries. Because you can have a set of industries who are de facto subcontracting for the global economic, global market and global uh, uh, monopoly capital which is uh, managing and running that market and shaping it. Uh, you can have many. Turkey has, for instance, but all of them are subcontractor I would say in the case of Turkey, de facto of Germany. Hmm? Uh, <clears throat> but China, the, the sovereign project is different. And this project cannot be, a, a, so, is a sovereign project because it is planned. Planned doesn't mean necessarily the bureaucratic, inefficient, etc. Uh, planning. No, it means it is, uh, there is a, a systematic thinking, there are targets, and even for the uh, private sector or for the public sector which is uh, run also accepting market rules. Uh, the planning cannot be by orders, it is uh, anticipation about what could happen and it is given a very big importance. And if you read the uh, Chinese plans carefully and if you read the results, you see that the the uh, results are not very different from what was planned. They are uh, better or worse or, uh, 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 or uh, having appearing uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, differences between uh, 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 actual achievements and uh, um, the intentions of the plan, but not, uh, not gigantically uh, wrong, and that is, is very important. Uh, that is, using again a Chinese formula, walking on two legs. One leg is this one, the, and this one can uh, have uh, targets of exports because they, it provides the imports uh, and it provides the capacity to import technologies and so on, but it has to, and it is being corrected as 2002 by uh, the gap between the rate of growth of exports and the rate of growth of internal market being gradually re reduced. Chinese are, are no, never going fast. Huh? Uh, they are always uh, planning on the long run by uh, not, not, not a brutal uh, change of line uh, in the Soviet tradition, for instance. Huh? Uh, that is one leg. 
The other leg is precisely that one of not moving into the, um, into the um, uh, integrated uh, monetary and financial market by uh, managing their financial system uh, and uh, the, the yuan. This is one area of, as you know, uh, continuous, if not conflict, uh, the uh, US protesting and you are behind. Uh, the rate of uh, the rate of exchange of the yuan is too low, blah blah blah, etc. And the answer of the governor of the central bank of China: the yuan is our currency; it is your problem. No? So solve your problem to adjust to China, and don't ask us to adjust to you. Eh? Uh, uh, and that is very very important, and that makes the, 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 this sovereign project successful and different. Now, that sovereign project has produced growing inequalities. But let, let us be careful about growing inequalities. The, these are growing inequalities without growing poverty, even of a minority, with, with, uh, with on the opposite, reducing relative poverty. And uh, uh, so uh, my criticism to the Gini uh, uh, Mm, uh, coefficients is that one. Gini coefficients are very relevant if we consider a, a, a society structured, given the structure and the structure doesn't change, in the short run, because it indicates if the trend is towards more or less inequality. But it is not a, a tool for measuring uh, apparently same phenomenon, inequality, right? in different social systems. Uh, there you have to look at it more carefully. So a growing inequality, let's say to, to make it a caricature, uh, with a growing, a growing uh, rate, uh, um, uh, uh, bet better conditions for the middle class, more than better conditions also for the popular classes, that is the working class and the peasants, and a small minority of even millionaires and so on. That is one pattern. And the other pattern is to take a, an example, India, where you have the same move in the Gini coefficient, but with growing pauperization of uh, half, or perhaps more than half, of the people, of the uh, particularly more the peasants, and the poor in towns, the shanty towns, and so on. It's very different, social and political. Because I would say, and that is what the Chinese Maoists say today, the Chinese society is for that reason very stable, very stable, because everybody's happy. It doesn't mean that there is no criticism and, and struggles, but uh, it, it is stable, while the others are not, because precisely of that process. In the other cases, we have emerging associated with lumpen development, not in the Chinese case. Now, so therefore we ought to be careful distinguishing emerging markets, which I would call in a more trivial way uh, uh, um, uh, expanding markets, which, uh, and, and only that, or emerging societies or countries, call them as you want, uh, that are two different historical phenomenon. And it cannot be analyzed purely in economic terms because it is in the terms of language uh, and, and concepts of historical materialism inter integrating the political and the social perspective that you can understand the, the, the phenomenon. Now, that is um, the, uh, the case of an emergent uh, society. Now, we, if we look at the others, uh, now uh, I come back to the question of the, uh, very briefly, because I have written a lot on that, on the question of land, rural land not being a commodity. There are uh, uh, marginal exceptions with land uh, uh, which is recuperated by the expansion of urban areas, uh, possibly also plots for a modernization out of the family uh, exploitation of the land, but on small scale, 
uh, that could expand with uh, with uh, uh, higher population of, of Chinese Han in uh, in uh, particularly in um, in um, uh, Central Asia, mm? uh, but roughly it remains so. Now the format, and I have given a lot of details on that. The format of how this uh, non-commodity, common goods, say, uh, uh, agricultural land is associated, is managed in different ways uh, by, uh, 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 you, have the f you have something very important to see for the longer run, particularly those who are green. Small production without small property and distinguishing the two. Um, in China, you have small production, if we mean by small enterprises, which are, after all, family farming, hmm? uh, without small property. They are not owners of their land. Hmm? Uh, and that is not only exclusively rural, it is also, to a very large extent, the unclassificable, with the concept of the West, uh, number of activities in the urban areas hmm, of China along with, of course, uh, larger normal enterprises, industrial and trade and so on. Um, now, so uh, that, that is a very important point. Now, if we take this criterion um, and we look into the other emerging countries, that is the successful, which, who had high rate of growth associated with, indeed, progress in I wouldn't say industrialization, but in industries. <laughs> that is different, again. Eh? Uh, case of India, case of uh, Brazil, but these are two gi gigantic countries, but also case of uh, more normal countries in their size, like Malaysia, uh, or, or, uh, or perhaps Turkey even, uh, and perhaps other countries. It is being said Colombia, I, I think it's uh, Mascarade there, but that's another problem, uh, here and there, hmm? to various degrees. Now, there you have, if first, none of them is based on uh, the negation of private property of land. And therefore, all of them are uh, places, areas, where you have the acceleration of process of land dispossession. Hmm? And that is a major, gigantic difference. That is, whatever be the rate of industries, if not industrialization, it does not absorb. Now, the fact, the difference is that to a certain extent, and the Chinese uh, Maoists are not very optimistic about, are severe. They said uh, the system masters the transfer from rural to urban, but not enough. Hmm? Uh, but the transfer from rural to urban in the other countries is not mastered at all. It is zero. Huh? So uh, between zero and 70%, 70% is not 100%, but it's better than zero. Uh, so we have to be very careful about that. About now, This is one leg. The other leg, which is the financial participating to, to the financial system, two countries, and only two countries to my knowledge, which are India and Russia, have maintained until now their not uh, the control of their capital account, but much less control than China, half-half. Hmm? Huh? Uh, in, in that sense, uh, they associate successfully, apparently, some aspect of emerging, that is, the industries which are developing in India and Brazil particularly are not just industries, there is some industrial system, but the industrial system is not, uh, is not conceived and created by a systematic policy. It is left to the spontaneous tendencies uh, full of limitations and contradictions. There is no industrial policy in India. There was in the time, time of Nehru, huh? but there is no today. I don't know what is the situation with respect to Russia. 
I have heard in Russia the two uh, sounds of uh, the two, uh, some say, and people who know and who are critical so say yes and others say no. I don't know where is the truth in between. Huh? Anyway, so that, that is a, a, a first a big difference. Then we have the countries which appear to be successful in terms of rates of growth, um, but which are um, not emerging at all. And I was uh, uh, having an interview with our friend from Indonesia. Indonesia is typically the, 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 the type of that, and perhaps other countries of Southeast Asia in different ways. Uh, but Indonesia is typical because it's not a small country first, and therefore uh, even 5% rate of growth when we have such a wide population means uh, a widening, enlarging market for sure, eh? in many respects, it's not just uh, peanuts. Uh, but it is based, it is based on plunder of the natural resources, particularly wood in the case, but also oil and more classic, um, which is, um, which is a, a catastrophe for Indonesia in the longer run and for humankind probably because it has uh, enormous effects uh, at the ecological level. Uh, uh, that is not emerging. Then on that can be grafted a expanding comprador market of middle classes and also a number of industries without an industrial project, and some of them being subcontracted sub by international, de facto, eh? because they can be private property of uh, the new class of in so-called industrialist Indonesian, or I don't know what, associated, but uh, de facto, and some others, uh, apparently more autonomous because they are more interconnected with the expanding market of the middle classes. That is a very different, it's not a sovereign project. It's not a sovereign project at all. And it has very little future. Uh, it, it is, uh, uh, it is, it is, hypotheque, um, uh, um, how do you say? Hypotheque le futur. Um, it is, hmm? mortgaging the future to a terrible extent. And uh, we have that in Africa on a large scale that is uh, the uh, relatively not bad rates of growth of Africa on the average, which are uh, saluted by the World Bank as uh, um, glorious uh, uh, success, are uh, most of them uh, related directly to the plunder of natural resources and nothing else. Hmm? Now, uh, <clears throat> um, we have some more complicated uh, features here and there. Uh, if I had time, I would uh, look at uh, Malaysia in particular. Uh, on the other side, I would look more particularly at uh, countries like uh, 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 Brazil and other countries of Latin America, etc. Now, which means that that all means that. Um, now, I, I shall not, I shall not repeat what I said previously, which would would have come more uh, logically now, but questions were asked which were ahead of uh, of Skidal, with respect to the um, areas of that growing conflict which are precisely the five advantages through, uh, through, through which um, a generalized monopoly capital can hope by maintaining them, maintaining its overall control and pumping of, of surplus value plus waste uh, of natural resources uh, to its uh, exclusive benefit. That is the control of technology, the control extent. You, you can see in the case of the control of technology, that China is the only country which is uh, not only importing technology, but absorbing it and able to reproduce it and perhaps even develop it later by its own. And they have been very severe in the contracts with Siemens for the high-speed train, in the contracts with Airbus for the 
uh, 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 no other country in the South has been as severe. Therefore, I would conclude that by saying that the success of China is not due to its moving into globalization, but to its control of its moving into globalization. That is something very different from just adjusting to globalization. Uh, now, these are areas of uh, conflict. Now, that leads me to another point. Um, what is the future of all that, uh, uh, of that system? Now, my uh, analysis leads me that uh, the conflict is uh, growing to the extent, to a very dangerous extent, and that therefore there is a need if we are in favor of the rise of the nations of the South, which is fundamental for me. I mean, <laughs> uh, if this is the historical target, huh? um, to uh, one, to build, let's call it a common front vis a vis the project and the strategies of generalized monopoly capital of the historical imperialist center of the new collective imperialism. Second, to associate this uh, 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 strategy to uh, a vision of the uh, long road to socialism. Long road. Not building socialism tomorrow, eh? or moving away from, uh, uh, from it fast, but as preparing the next stages. Now, these are the two challenges the two real challenges. Now, uh, if we look at those two real challenges, one, yes, uh, you see, I'll take the, the uh, almost caricature case of uh, uh, some relations between China, but we could say the same with India and Brazil, but we would think that uh, it's normal for India and Brazil, which uh, are capitalist and never uh, suggested that they are not, but it, it could look uh, not normal for China, who pretends to be different and socialist even, etc., <clears throat> uh, in their relation with Africa. Now, in the relations with Africa, what is the attitude of the West, the donors, the club of donors, which is the club of plunderers uh, of, of Africa? Hmm? Uh, <coughs> the Western uh, imperialist countries, the US, uh, European Union, USA, the uh, uh, World Bank, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all those people. They, are, they have their organization of uh, donors. What they say is that you have first the fundamental conditionality. You have to accept globalization as it is. That is, you have to accept um, to be fully integrated in the system as it is, and then private capital will come and make the miracle for you. Hmm? Uh, that is their position. And therefore, completely also against supporting a sovereign project, they hate it, and a fortiori a sovereign project of uh, both uh, uh, industrialization, organized industrialization, and food sovereignty. Hmm? That is totally out. But China, when they come into relations with Africa, does not put that out of the possibilities. They say, we want what we, we, want, what we want. We know what we want. For instance, in Zambia, I discussed this matter a few days ago, uh, we want copper. Uh, well, this is open to negotiation. How organized, how managed, how etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What do you want in counterpart? If you want precisely what the West will never give you, that is moving into industrialization and creating the infrastructure proper to that, as they had done in the time of, of now with the Tanzam, eh, with the railway Dar es Salaam, uh, Lusaka, we are prepared to do it. But now, if the country in question is summarized in its president, and the president is just a person, a man, who wants $100 million in its pocket. 
and nothing else. Well, the temptation is very strong to have the copper at that very low price. But there is a room for a renegotiation. So the ball is in the, in the camp of the other countries of the South. Those who are uh, not emerging, who are still sinking, but which uh, could start thinking differently. That is, of course, uh, a, an internal battle. Now, the other aspect is the connection of all that with socialism and capitalism. Now, uh, assuming that uh, the better would happen, that is, uh, the pattern of the sovereign project is given a growing, let's call it modestly, social dimension, not socialist. That is uh, less inequality, more uh, uh, social services, better health, pension, etc. Um, and is associated with something very complicated. I will have only a few minutes to deal with it democratization of the society, not accepting the pluriparty elections as the uh, blueprint and the uh, magic tool, but. Uh, going back to the mass line that is learning from the people, etc. Call it uh, participatory democracy if you want. A lot of things. Eh? Moving along that, that is associating and not dissociating uh, democratization of the society, a long process, a historical process, eh? with uh, social progress, preparing going beyond social progress, to change in the relations, social relations. And third, reinforcing the national sovereignty that is compelling the system to global, globalize, remain globalized, but as a, the language would be non-hegemonic, that is pluricentric, ne really negotiated, which enlarged the room. Now, whether who is going to take advantage of that? Is it the bourgeoisie? including the potential bourgeoisie which is coming out of the uh, power system, the Mao thought about it, uh, 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 becoming national or more national and less comprador, or is it the popular classes? Hmm? Uh, <clears throat> now, that is the issue. That is the issue. It's not socialism or capitalism, you see. It's uh, the issue of we can call it class struggle because this uh, is an envelope for a, a wide uh, range of uh, historical phenomena, of course, huh? but it is uh, somehow different from the oversimplification of uh, um, building socialism. <clears throat> um, now, um, this is my, uh, uh, my vision of that growing conflict. Um, now, Vis-à-vis -vis that, the imperial center, the collective imperialism, and particularly the United States, and particular, particularly because they have lost their hegemony while remaining the leadership of the collective imperialism, lost their hegemony in the sense that they are no more uh, the, uh, mm, so the center of, uh, let's call it innovation if we want to, uh, uh, exclusively, etc., um, that um, uh, uh, leads to uh, a very dangerously nervous position, which is that, uh, as of Clinton, the only the, uh, uh, conclusion was that the only way to maintain uh, this leadership and the collective operating for the benefit of the collective imperial is the military control of the planet. And this is where, unfortunately I don't have time enough, uh, but this is where also that conflict is involving those countries which are not emerging, but which are, uh, which are uh, still uh, down. Mm. Uh, particularly the Arab countries, but not exclusively the Arab countries, um, that this system is no more uh, viable. 
are no more, not sustainable and therefore explodes. Eh? The process of permanent lumpen development um, um, uh, is, 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 has such uh, dramatic, uh, neg dramatic uh, social uh, if, uh, uh, effects that it is no more acceptable. But uh, things a little similar happen even if they are a little less dramatic. They are dramatic because being uh, without home uh, in London or worse in the uh, in, uh, in the United States, uh, in cold weather, uh, is not something very am amusing. Eh? It's no, not much more, not much more better than being uh, a poor elsewhere. Hmm? But uh, perhaps globally, overall, less dramatic for those who are impoverished in a less. Anyway, it happens also there. So that leads me uh, now. <coughs> Those explosions, but again, I, this morning I had the opportunity to answer to some questions with respect to the Arab countries. Um, I read it also with respect to the Arab countries and particularly to Egypt. Perhaps I am a little biased, but still as the beginning of a long wave. That is, my reading of the Egyptian history is long waves of rise and long waves of... Uh, stagnation and even uh, uh, decline. We had a long way from uh, Muhammad Ali in the beginning of the 19th century to the middle of Khedou Ismail to the mid 70s of the, that is 60 years, um, of modernization with uh, a, a high degree of uh, national autonomy uh, and success in that. Uh, and then we had a long wave uh, starting with the uh, uh, financial, uh, financial uh, breakdown of the Khedou Ismail, uh, 1877, I think, to the British occupation, 1882 to 1920, 40 years, May, uh, of uh, submission decline and restructuring from a relatively progressing autonomous, which aim to be a partner in the centers into a real periphery. Uh, the famous uh, cotton uh, farm for Lancashire. Uh, and then we had a long wave from 1920 to 1967 or to 1970, uh, that is to the defeat of the war of 67 or to the death of Nasser which was in which with two subphase, one let's call the Waft period and this other Nasserian period of a project, also a sovereign project of emerging. And then a long period of 40 years of decline, uh, Sadat and Mubarak, and now we are starting perhaps a long period. So I put all the questions with respect to the rise of the nations and the peoples of the South in that long framework. I don't think that it can be, and it is there that, of course, it cannot be analyzed purely in, uh, unless in conventional economic terms, uh, irrespective of taking into account uh, the working of the society, the class struggles, the political culture, the uh, etc., etc., all those dimensions, and the geopolitics also. Um, that is, uh, um, now, Vis-a-vis -vis that, what can we have uh, with the uh, 21st century? Um, some people, particularly in uh, Venezuela, have been very uh, hurriedly uh, uh, saying, what is socialism for the 21st century? Hmm? I am quite unable to answer to that question. Uh, it's very easy uh, on paper to write uh, the rules uh, managing a beautiful, uh, a complete so socialist society and even communist society, uh, uh, which I, I look at, but I look at it as a higher level of development of civilization of humankind. And this is far more than uh, 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 more efficiency and more social justice, uh, but within the same. And it's difficult to 
impossible even to, to summarize. But you have to start. And the future starts always today, not tomorrow. Hmm? And uh, how to start in, in that perspective? And that is my conclusion, my conclu audacity. Audacity means that what is being, until now, if we look at what has been developing throughout the 15 first years of this uh, 21st decade, and perhaps we could say 20 years starting from the mid 90s, um, very fast, uh, the end of the, uh, of the illusions of the Belle Epoque and the start of the people protesting and organizing and moving into struggles in order, but in a fragmented way and in a de on defensive lines, uh, more to defend, to protect what they had been achieved before and is, is gradually eroded by the uh, success, uh, the new patterns of neoliberalism, then more. How to move from there to an alternative offensive? This was the question which was raised, I think, yesterday, a major question, or this morning, a major question about contributing to the building of an uh, alternative historic block of the victims, a variety of classes. And I would say, to be very brief, for the North as well as for the South, oh, and perhaps for the North we can speak a little in singular, a little to a certain extent, because still from a country to another there are differences, and for sure in plural for the South, which are not one. Uh, uh, I would say uh, audacity means uh, a, a alternative block in the North, anti-generalized monopolies. Hmm? Because the victims are not only the industrial working class who is growing unemployment with the effect of uh, delocalization to the benefit of capital, etc. Not only the majority, two-thirds maybe, of the wage earners, which include, uh, without going into this debate, productive and in, uh, non-productive activities and so on, but also, also, uh, wide segments managed by capitalist uh, property, uh, which are in particular the modern agriculture, which is a capitalist modern agriculture, but family and farmers, which are the so-called small and middle enterprises, uh, and that is uh, a, a, a historical block that I think can, could be built, and that is the challenge for you uh, British people, for uh, the other Europeans, um, together or not together, etc., <laughs> uh, etc. Et uh, which implies starting with nationalization. Uh, but nationalization with a view, which is possible, of socialization, which is inventing, and therefore not easy to describe in advance, the ways and means of managing. Uh, I have gave, given some examples how, how they could be conceived to start with, but not, uh, not with a, the uh, idea of uh, producing a blueprint uh, for what is socialism, but just ideas to be uh, not only discussed theoretically, but uh, through uh, practice. Eh? Now, for the South, it is an anti-comprador, I would say, historical block. Uh, anti-comprador means, uh, means uh, uh, starting by understanding that the logic of that any sovereign project cannot be successful unless it accepts to be in conflict with imperialism. Cannot be successful. It would turn to, uh, even w while achieving apparently some good results in the short period, would turn into a blind alley. And second, cannot be that without a growing support of the majority of uh, working classes, of the majority of popular classes. And therefore, it has to associate, the, when I come back to the, the point of departure, uh, democratization of the society 
with social progress and with not only national sovereignty as a nationalist, narrow, a fortiori, chauvinist, eh? but uh, associated with the building of South-South uh, anti-imperialist cooperation. And I would call it anti-imperialist cooperation. Now, uh, that is the, uh, what, and I'll conclude on that, I, I think that this is the program of uh, the organization to which I have contributed building the World Forum for Alternatives. That is uh, a network of think tanks of the radical left of uh, many countries uh, to discuss that, not uh, in, uh, on the basis of, let's call it serious uh, research, but not academic serious research, uh, related to uh, commitment and not only moral commitment to the poor or I don't know what, but political commitment to um, contribute to the building of the alternative historical social bloc. Thank you. <laughs>